everybody to this uh, first session of the Leuven Seminar of the New Year 2021. Tonight we have a session with Ansgar Lucy from University of uh, Heidelberg and with Nuria Sanchez Madrid from University of Madrid. Um, Ansgar Lucy is a postdoctoral researcher at University of Heidelberg. His actual and official research concerns the notion of causality in Hegel and this is a project that is funded by the Fritz Thesen Stiftung. But Ansgar, you might know this, maintains a broad scope in his research and also works on or has worked on Leibniz, Kant, Lambert, Crucius, Garve, Maupertuis, Euler and also on Diderot. He has published a book on causality and teleology in Leibniz which was published as a Studia Leibniziana Sonderheft in 2016. In 2018, he has published a re-edition of the first volume of Bauterweck's Idee einer Apodiktik from 1799, and he has republished this with Froman Holzburg. He has also co-edited a collection on Kant and post-Kantian philosophy with the title Das Selbst und die Welt, intended as a festschrift for Günther Zöller and published in 2019 with Königshausen und Neumann. Very recently, he has published with Christopher Yeomans a collection uh, on practical dim dimensions of normativity and Kant, entitled Kant on Morality, Humanity and Legality. And so this was published in the still fresh year 2021 with Paul Brave Macmillan. Also very, very recently he has finished his Habilitation, so congratulations with that. Um, the title of the presentation today uh, is The Nature of Anthropological Knowledge, Kant's Anthropology as a Theory of Integration. Now Ansgar will give his presentation and then we will have a response by Nuria Sanchez Madrid. Um, please remain muted during the presentation and if possible, <coughs> turn on the screen. Of course, this is not an obligation, but we think that it uh, makes the atmosphere better. Um, the, the, the program of um, the Leuven Seminar uh, can be uh, seen online on the website of the Leuven Seminar. Um, I will say a few words about the next session afterwards. So I, I guess I give the word, I give the floor to Ansgar now. Um, Karin. Yes, I just wanted to add that, the, uh, that there is a handout uh, that you can find in the chat. Okay, so Ansgar. We are very uh, curious to hear what you have to say today. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Henny and Karen, for inviting me here to uh, give a talk at the Leuven workshop uh, series, which is a great honor to me. And as Henny already uh, has indicated, this is a part of my Habilitationsschrift, which I hope to one day publish under the name Humankind and Humanity in Kant. So I'm discussing the relation between uh, our, the nature of the human species and the obligations that are often uh, labeled under the name humanity in Kant's philosophy. <clears throat> and I think you can immediately see how this ties into uh, the title and the topic of today's presentation, um, anthropology, Kant's anthropology as a theory of integration. So, while Kant obviously is mostly known for his critical philosophy as a theorist of the subject, the rational pure subject, he also had a lot of interesting and often very influential things to say about the nature of the human species. Interestingly, though, he does not approach that topic in the way that others of his contemporaries and predecessors would have done. Usually people would have approached that topic either by looking at the human body, which is what the people were doing natural history and physiology and medicine would do, <clears throat> like Buffon and Linné, 
and Linnaeus, they would look at the human body and see how it is uh, unique and different from animal bodies. And the other main strand of approaching the question of what the human species is, is uh, the more philosophical question about the nature of the human soul, which as a rational and free soul is unique to humans on earth at least. <clears throat> and uh, Kant, this is what, what has been done by the Wolfians and Baumgarten and the big strand of Leibnizian philosophers prominent in Germany at Kant's time. And Kant rejects both these approaches. A human body is not of interest in philosophy, which is something that he already writes very early in a letter to Marcus Herz, and he maintains it pretty much throughout his, his life. And uh, just by looking at the human body, we do not learn anything that is of philosophical relevance. Yeah, we may, of course, make medicinal progress, uh, progress in medicine and so on, but this is not relevant to philosophy. And on the other side, the human soul as an immortal and immaterial object, as it has been deemed also by the Leibnizians, is no object of knowledge, as he deems in the critical philosophy, because it is not something that we can have an experience of. So he has a strong concept of the human soul, but it's very different and not as much connected to the nature of the human species as uh, the people like Leibniz, Wolf, and Baumgarten would have it. So what kind of knowledge does the anthropology provide when it is not connected to the traditions of rational psychology, the doctrine of the human soul, nor to the tradition of physiology? And this question was, of course, first posed famously by Foucault in his dissertation on the anthropology. And, uh, I think I have a different angle to this that I would like to discuss and uh, present here today. So the, um, the unique approach of anthropology, of Kant's anthropology to the human species is rather unclear for a very obvious reason to anyone who has read the anthropology. The anthropology is a book that deals with a great variety of topics and themes that are articulated in very different uh, forms of knowledge. So he deals with the, the propensities and dispositions of the human body, and, but also about what we can learn from literature and what we can learn from uh, looking at the different races and ethnicities, what the different genders, um, how the different genders are constituted. He discusses mentality and also a lot of details of, of human life and about the, the alcohol consumption at dinner parties is an example that I will later get back on. And if we would put this diversity of knowledge into today's framework of sciences and academic disciplines, we would find that it overlaps largely with a great uh, amount of what we now call the humanities, a name that was unavailable to Kant, and also, of course, to uh, the life sciences of the human body, namely still physiology and medicine that enters here to a specific degree. <clears throat> And um, these different materials that are discussed are also understood through uh, different, different uh, sources and uh, by different forms of knowledge. I mean, he discusses what we can learn from religious figures, what, how saints can uh, inspire us. This is something that we learn by reading religious texts, but other um, <clears throat> uh, um, materials are learned through empirical observation and so on. So it's a, it's a great heterogeneity of themes and topics and uh, approaches that do not really seem to make a whole. And this has been a staple point in criticism that has been leveled against Kant's anthropology ever since it came out. One of the first reviews um, of the public, published book was written by Schleiermacher and he calls it a collection of trivialities. And this is a, um, uh, an accusation that has followed Kant's anthropology ever since. It's an unsystematic hodgepodge of different uh, things 
that are trivial to philosophy, that have no impact to philosophy. And I want to look at this accusation and see whether we can maybe turn this into something positive. So in the past, of course, this has been met by a wide array of, of interpretations that are often very different, much more different sometimes than other works of Kant. Uh, to pick up just two of the more extreme examples would be, for example, Reinhard Brandt, who says that anthropology had, needs to be strictly separated from philosophy. There's no a priori discourse in it, and it's not articulated as a system because it's not based on an idea of reason. And Robert Loudon, in a forthcoming paper, but also in the, in the a lot of papers that he has been publishing in the past, says that philosophy, in the cosmopolitan sense at least, so in the sense in which we can make philosophy useful to the human being, is founded and made possible on anthropology. So we have a great variety of interpretations. And I think this is mostly due to the very heterogeneous nature and the um, apparently unsystematic structure of the, of the anthropology as it has been read uh, in the past. <clears throat> and my approach that I want to um, suggest here is that we look at the teleological judgment that most researchers agree makes up the, uh, the glue of the anthropology. So it is, it is a common thread, a common theme of the anthropology that there's a teleological judgment involved that uh, has some, this is something that Robert Loudon has worked on a lot that allows us to make some to discuss some very moderate norms that take place in the anthropology, but also a certain type of explanation that is unique to anthropology within the Kantian framework. So let me first briefly look at this teleological judgment, and then I want to flesh out some implications what it means that we have teleological explanations apply to a variety, wide variety of uh, themes and topics. So um, Kant gives us a couple of suggestions how we can understand this uh, teleological judgment. He says that pragmatic anthropology concerns what the human being as a free acting being, this is a quote from Kant, makes of himself or can and should make of himself themselves, one would say today. So we have a free acting being in the sense of the human being as someone who can put an end or goal to their own actions. And they can not only act with intention and purpose, but they also can make something of themselves. They can develop themselves. So this they can make something of themselves relates to an untapped development that is virtually embodied in us, in our, what I would like to call our given nature, and that needs to be developed through agency and habits so that it becomes somehow crystallized in our nature, not only in our biological nature, but also in our social nature. Kant does not, in this sense, have a very strong um, differentiation between our social and biological nature. He doesn't have a notion of biology. He never uses the term in, in his writings. <clears throat> so we have a potential that we can unfold that is not yet unfolded. This is something that distinguishes humans from, from animal species because an animal can as a major animal already do everything that it as a species is supposed to do. A major bird can fly, and this is what birds are supposed to do, they can fly. But the human being has a, has a potential that it can, this is something that we learn from the idea of you for universal history, that we can develop as a species only and not as an individual. And it is something that we should develop. So there's already in normativity embedded in our nature, something that is given to us by nature slash God, also something that Kant uses synonymously, and something that we are in a, in a 
very vague and loose sense and the anthropology at least <clears throat> obliged to, to develop. So we should actively use and further our unique natural dispositions and capabilities um, for two purposes. So there are two ends for that. We have on the one hand, we have our own purposes and on the other hand, we have natural purposes. So uh, I give a quotation from the Menschenkunde Vorlesungen. It's on the handout on, at the end of page one. Khan says similar things in his anthropology book, but I think this is more, more concise. So here he says, knowledge of the human being is twofold. Speculative knowledge of the human being makes us skilled and is treated in psychology and physiology. So something that we can deduce apparently, that is a dis produced from a disengaged, non-participatory observer. But practical, what you will later call pragmatical knowledge of the human being, what the pragmatical, uh, pragmatic anthropology is about, makes us prudent. It is a knowledge of the art of how one human being has influence on another and can lead them according to their purposes, him to his purpose. End quote. So, we have our purposes that play a big role here and we understand what the means and are that we can appropriately and adequately use within the social world, within human using other beings as tools. This has often brought the, um, the accusation that Kant is talking about manipulation here as he talks about having influence on another, but I think we should not read this in a too negative sense and I will later come back and give a few examples on this. I would rather propose that we call this our capability to successfully navigate the social world. This is not about being a puppet master and playing the, the piano with other people, the emotional, piano of other people or pulling the strings. This is about our success and navigating not only in the community that we are acquainted with because we grow up it, in it, but also other communities that we might encounter in other places or in other times and so on. <clears throat> These are our, our purposes for which we can use the knowledge that is gained here. But the other aspect that is uh, at stake here is uh, our natural purpose, what Kant calls the vocation. And we have a vocation as a natural species that is given to us by nature slash God and is embedded in us, in our, in our body, but also in our social manifestations. This is the second quotation of, uh, on, on page two. And I read it from the published anthropology, uh, anthropology Quote, the sum total of pragmatic anthropology in respect to the vocation of the human being and the characteristic of his formation, so how we form a character, being a moral agent, is the following. The human being is destined by his reason to live in a society with human beings and to cultivate himself, to civilize himself, and to moralize himself by means of the arts and sciences, end quote. So here also we have um, three goals, three purposes. I think we can subsume them under the moniker bringing forth our humanity, cultivating our talents, civilizing ourselves as in producing an environment in which moral actions is, are incentivized and moralizing ourselves in the sense that I can subject my own will under the moral law. By means of the arts and sciences, this is the heterogeneity of topics and themes that anthropology deals with, but which is here connected to our natural purpose, formulated in three tasks, but it is still one vocation to which everything here is directed at. So we have two purposes, our own, subjective purposes uh, to navigate the social world and our embodied purpose as a human species. And I think Kant assumes that they both should ideally coincide. 
and that the coincision of both purposes provides an evaluative standard that becomes apparent all through the anthropology. So uh, Alex Cohn, who also has written a lot on this topic, and I think she's also present in this, this chat, she, she has an expression that I like a lot, that we, in anthropology, we shift back and forth between an inquiry into the nature of our species and an inquiry into the intentions and motivations of the individual. Yes, of course, we, we do both. And they need to align with each other. Otherwise, we're doing something wrong. It's not, not necessarily morally wrong. Usually, it will be morally wrong. But it will be inadequate. It is an unskilled and dysfunctional use of our natural capabilities if we do something that does not further the purpose of our vocation. <clears throat> and we will find a lot of uh, examples where this can't discuss this, this kind of failure, not only moral failure, but also dis dysfunctional societal structures and wrong examples that are set by others. And we can understand that this is a so dysfunctional societal structure or bad example because it does not help us align our subjective purposes with our natural purposes. And this knowledge to align the appropriate means to our ends is what Kant calls prudence. This has already uh, appeared in the uh, first quotation that I has read. So pr being prudent, uh, Kant is a little bit unclear. The textual evidence is a little bit uh, ambiguous on this kind, but I think we can, we can say that for Kant in general, prudence is our knowledge of using appropriate means for our ends. So in a broad sense, Kant distinguishes between skill that allows us to just have some technical knowledge about what we can do and how we can do it, like using a hammer to put in a nail. And prudence is to understand how we can apply the skill for my benefit. I need, why do I need a nail here and not on somewhere else? Yeah, does it matter to me? Does it further my purposes, my own needs and desires and what I'm inclined to do by moral obligation. And wisdom is then another level of interpretation and knowledge that allows us to unify this potential knowledge under one final purpose, that the goodwill, hopefully something that also coincides with the human vocation. <clears throat> but uh, this is where we would leave the anthropology and go into Kant's ethics, because uh, the, the um, Highest good is something that does not play a big role here in the anthropology, but only in the uh, groundwork and the critique of practical reason in the sense that this is what Kant says, that the rational subject should align his or her will with. But here in um, the anthropology, he discusses the purposes, the actual purposes, of um, embodied human beings in regard to a standard that is applied and provided by the vocation of humankind that we can understand uh, intellectually. So anthropology both requires us to understand our social skills and it, it helps us understand our social skills and it helps us to understand how we can develop and further these skills, how to align our purposes in the social world with our natural purposes and our natural capabilities. So it means that we understand the dispositions that we have and the range of applications in their appropriate contexts. <clears throat> and so this connectivity of or connection between broad material variety of material topics and uh, content of, of knowledge about us as a species and of our social contexts and this teleological alignment with the general purpose is what provides us a theory of integration and then now i come to the next point in the handout, I have a specific dedicated chapter for this that allows us to understand um, from, a, from a perspective of uh, philosophy of science, 
how this relates um, in, uh, a model of inquiry to um, how this develops a model of inquiry, a model of understanding empirical structures as if anthropology would be a science. So Kant does occasionally call anthropology a science, but not in the rigid mathematical precise sense, like physics is a science. Again, Kant is a bit unclear on this. But so let me look at this from the angle, and maybe I can make this a little bit clearer than, than Hopefully, then Kant even did. I mean, this is what an interpretation of a historical text might be. So, a theory of integration. This is an exam, an expression that I borrow from um, philosophers of uh, science who write about Darwin's theory of evolution. <clears throat> I, I take this from Wolfgang Le Fabre, but other people like Ernst Meyer have been also using this expression that seems to be rather frequent in uh, philosophy of science. So a theory of integration, let me illustrate what this means by talking for a brief moment about Darwinian theory of evolution. So at Darwin's time, there were already theories of evolution available, like Lamarck, for example, in the sense of how species change over the course of time. Giraffes get longer necks in Lamarck as well, so the species changes a little bit, but the, the point that is unique and innovative, incredibly innovative in Darwinian theory of evolution is that he does not only provide one of many biological subdisciplines that exist. So theory of evolution is not only one biological science or subdiscipline next to physiology, morphology, ethology, so the science of uh, behavior of animals, physical geography, of uh, genetics, what we now have, and so on. But the theory of evolution provides a, an explanatory framework in which the different life sciences, as we call them now, or biological subdisciplines can be related to each other and they can make sense through each other. And um, thereby, Darwin's uh, theory of evolution is not one biological subdiscipline, it is one subdiscipline in the sense that it provides us, for example, an understanding of the phylogenetic tree in which all animal species are related to each other. But it also provides us an integrative framework of principles which can be applied to other disciplines as well, which are not derived from other disciplines because the principles of evolution are not derived from genetics or morphology or ethology, but they are derived from the theory of evolution, but applied to them and thereby biology can be formed into a coherent whole. Again, this is not my interpretation. Wolfgang Lefebvre has written a lot about this. I found the quote by a crucial and seminal paper by Theodor Dobchansky. I don't really know how to pronounce the name. This is another quotation on the handout on page three. Very, very interesting. The, the paper is titled, and this has become apparently something like a an expression, a slogan maybe even, in theory of biology. Nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Without the theory of evolution and its teleonomic explanations, teleonomic is an expression coined by Ernst Meyer, biology is just a quote again from Dobchansky, a pile of sundry facts, some of them interesting or curious, but making no meaningful picture as a whole, end quote. And Ernst Meyer, another influential theoretician of evolution, puts it, there's not a single why question in biology that can be answered adequately without consideration of evolution, end quote. So, you know, Darwin's famous example of the, of the um, different birds that have developed a, a similar beak because they eat similar foods, even though they are different species on different continents and so on. And so what we can do now with the, with the theory of evolution and its principles such as natural selection and the struggle of life and the 
principles of mutation and inheritance. I don't really need to get into the details here, but the general point is we can now use these principles to make sense of very different facts that are borrowed and investigated in, borrowed from and investigated in different biological sciences. So the genetics of these beaks in themselves can explain a lot of things like Mendelian theories of inheritance as developed by Mendel is a perfectly fine theory in itself and it explains a lot about questions of inheritance but only if you connect it with physiology and then physiology with the theory of in survival in a specific environment physical geography you can understand why a certain genome is successful in providing a specific beak, which then again is successful in providing, being used as a tool to, uh, to gain uh, food in a specific environment, to deal with a very specific type of nut. And that again is, can be explained in regard to the purposes of natural selection and the struggle of life. This is what makes a species successful at reproduction. Birds with this beak, they are successful and birds with a different beak, they would not be successful, at least not in this environment. And as long as you have a notion of success or adequacy and so on, you have certain normative constraints and norms and teleology involved here. So in Darwinian theory of evolution, this is not proper teleology because we do not have an end that it is implanted in nature and that directs animals towards a specific goal. So this is why people call it in relation to Kant's notion of Zweckmäßigkeit, it's teleonomy. So it's as if it is teleological. It's a formal type of teleology, but it's not actual directedness at its purpose, but purposiveness, Zweckmäßigkeit. For Kant, of course, as an actual purpose, but since the formal structure is the same here, we do not need to, to bother so much with the detail that in Darwin, this is only a formal type of teleology. But this kind of teleological explanation connects different types of knowledge from genetical analysis to observation of behavior to an understanding of an environmental role in the adaptation and the development of species and so on. And it, it connects them into a unified science, biology or life sciences, if you will. And we can answer a lot of why questions now with uh, regard to the pr principles provided to by, by Darwin's theory of evolution. And now my argument here is that Darwin's anthrop uh, Kant's anthropology works in, a, in an analogous way. So by the, by the purposive principles and by the teleological explanations that Kant provides, we can also unify this heterogeneous corpus of knowledge because it allows us to develop a standard of successful implementation and adequacy in regard to a natural goal, namely the vocation of the species, which here takes up the place of Darwin's um, natural selection. <clears throat> this would not have been the intention of Kant, just like it has not been the intention of Darwin to do unify uh, biology into one single, one single science. This is something that philosophers and historians of science have only understood one and a half uh, centuries later. So Darwin has not aimed to do that as far as I know, I'm not a historian of science, but as far as I've read Darwin and philosophers of biology, this has not been his intention, but the way his, theory of evolution works in practice, in, in the uh, general outline of life sciences, evolutionary theory takes up this role. And if we apply this model to Kant's anthropology, we will find a lot of similarities, at least on a formal and structural level. So we do have that we do have a couple of principles that are supposed to hold for all the the um, 
corpus of knowledge that is somehow related to us as human beings and is somehow um, well i'm back yes. okay i don't i don't know what happened i'm sorry i'm not at the office right now because due to the pandemic i cannot use the office so um i maybe i can i don't know let's go a, a i should do so let's a little bit back because the last uh, sentences were not very clear okay i'm i'm sorry maybe uh let's just hope this does not happen again i don't know what i'm what i could do there there's no problem uh, okay so where was i so um just like just like darwin's uh theory of evolution has been um unified by a set of uh, teleological principles teleonomical principles Kant's anthropology has a set of uh, teleological principles that provide unity to a very heterogeneous body of knowledge so and i can i can find a couple of principles that seem to be established here and that seem to hold for everything that is uh, relevant for the human being and uh, that would be the unity of uh, knowledge and consciousness by means of the representation of the eye that uh, kant introduces at the beginning of the anthropology and uh, I think this is important for two reasons. This is not only one of the reasons why we are free agents, because we can set ourselves goals, but also because this is what distinguishes us from animals. Kant is very clear on this point that the human being is the only being on earth that can represent themselves by uh, the representation of a formal I you know that there's more to this story when we look at the critical philosophy but this is not really important yet the next principle would be the vocation of humanity or humankind to develop themselves this is something that kant has discussed already in his very early writings and that seems to be a gen generally an idea that is floating around in the enlightenment i think it's an aristotelian idea about the telos that is embedded in every species that has been mediated through shaftesbury and his understanding of the purposiveness of the different um, inborn capabilities in each species and the economical structure of the, the general uh, of the general system of nature and then of course through the german debate of the bestimmung des menschen the vocation of humanity uh, which also through spalding seems to be very uh, profoundly inspired by shaftesbury but not regarding this background as kant justifies this assumption of a teleological system in nature and the application of teleological judgments on uh, nature in the critique of judgment i'm not going to deal with this here because that would lead me very far astray from the anthropology into critical territory and uh, this is uh, this needs to be done in a, on a different occasion <clears throat> another crucial theme would be the separation of the three faculties which allows us to allows kant to organize the uh, the anthropology and then in relation to the vocation of humanity the idea that we are given with a virtual nature that still needs to be unfolded so that we have germs and predispositions keimer and anlagen as Kant calls them that have their purpose but that need to be um, developed and uh, unfolded through through actions and um, through the respective actions and then uh, finally that these this unfolding of terms and predisposition goes along with crystallized structures of our behavior called the character which is something that allows us explanation and prediction of human uh, behavior that we can um, understand the rules under which different people act and uh, how their motivations are aligned with their capabilities and their um, and their social context and these general principles 
can be used and are used, I think, not in every chapter and not in every paragraph of the anthropology, but very often in the cancer anthropology to organize knowledge and to explain very and relate very different themes and ideas and material content of knowledge to each other in regard to this final end of the vocation of humanity. So let me let me discuss an example. I have given a couple of quotes and on page four. Uh, something that Kant likes to discuss in both his ethical writings and in his anthropological uh, lectures and writings, namely the, the topic of drinking alcohol, which, as he calls it, deserves special consideration in a pragmatic anthropology. I'm not really sure why, but he emphasizes importance. And so I'm going to read and comment a little bit on two paragraphs uh, to make my point clearer on an example. So Kant writes, partaking in intoxicating food and drink is a physical means to excite or soothe the power of the imagination. So we have a biological basis on which different chemicals can interact with our cognitive faculties. This is our given nature. Some of these as poisons weaken the power of life, I skipped the examples, and others strengthen it, or at least alleviate its feeling like fermented beverages, wine and beer and so on. So it has good uses and bad uses. We can use this to, to this intoxication mechanism to weaken ourselves or to, to strengthen ourselves. So here already some kind of normative judgment is employed. But all of them are contrary to nature and artificial, which does not already mean that they are bad, all right? So this is something that we humans have been doing consciously. However, all of these methods are supposed to serve the purpose of making the human being forget the burden that seems to lie originally in life general. So this mechanism to connect the chemical substances that we ingest with our cognitive faculties is already a mechanism that has its purpose in the general outline of human life, namely to forget something that we find burdensome. Yeah? Because if we encounter burdens, this is something that we know from other Kant's writings and that is clear in this context, we become demotivated and we lose the, the mental fortitude to subject ourselves under the moral law. So we have a natural mechanism that can be used for our purpose in the general outline of life. And then it goes on a little bit later, the freedom from care that drunkenness produces, and along with it also, no doubt, the carelessness, is an illusory, illusory feeling of increased power of life. So we feel something that is not true, but the drunken man no longer feels life's obstacles whose overcoming nature is incessantly connected in which health also consists. So we have a natural propensity for health that is connected to an appropriate amount of alcohol that we ingest. Yeah, because it can strengthen our resolve to overcome the burdens that are imposed to us. And he, the drunken man, is happy in his weakness, not demotivated, since nature is actually striving in him to restore his life step by step through the gradual increase of his powers. Yeah, so we have life going hand in hand with the individual purpose of drinking alcohol for the sake of gaining motivation and losing the weakness that otherwise a burdensome life would impose on our mental, um, mental outline and on our motivational structure. So an adequate use of a moderate consumption of alcohol can make people brave and can open up their hearts, which is an instrumental vehicle of a moral quality called Kant, namely frankness. So honesty, honesty is a, is a duty and a virtue in Kant. Yeah? So we become to a certain degree, use this natural embodied mechanism. If we apply it in a, the appropriate social context and in an appropriate degree, 
for the sake of being virtuous, yeah, for, for being frank and open and having jovial dinner conversations. So what Kant here relates is biological knowledge about the, not the details, but the, the general field of biological knowledge of understanding the, the effects that certain substances have on our minds with knowledge of um, motivational structures that we would now call psychological knowledge, which he also connects to an ad, ad understanding of adequacy and moderation in specific social contexts. This is an example of the dinner party that he always uses again and again in these kind of writings. And, and then again to a, a different understanding, namely ethics, to, to virtue, to what it means to be brave and frank in a social context, to speak their mind being without being afraid of offending anyone and so on, to have a, have a social conversation that is open and not shy and restrained by false fears. So very, very different ideas from which we now would subdelegate to different disciplines and, and academic subdisciplines and different fields of knowledge are here united under this idea of natural purposiveness, what life is made up to, to overcome obstacles and to be healthy and to be frank and to be virtuous. And we, we can relate them to each other and we understand why we can be drunk in the first place and how we can use it in an appropriate social context. So very different forms of knowledge can be related to each other. There, I could give numerous examples from this. Not all discussions that Kant provides in anthropology follow this, this structure, but, but many. Another example that I'm very fond of is when he discusses pain. And his Kant's example, Kant's idea about discussing pain is we have a natural propensity that when the feeling of pain seeds to exist and when we become pain free, we feel pleasure. At least that's what Kant says. So this is a natural mechanism in our pain sensation that leads us to feel pleasure. And he gives a couple of hints, just brief hints, how this is used in different contexts, how this can create an addiction to gambling and how a theater place can be enjoyable because I'm afraid, he follows the Aristotelian model of catharsis and this sentence, I'm afraid and then I go out and I'm relieved again that I did not suffer like the like Socrates suffered, uh, Oedipus suffered, and so on. So theater plays can be enjoyable, and all this can be used for motivation and and uh, gaining moral fortitude, because it allows us to use biological mechanism in an appropriate social context, gambling and theater, to a moderate amount. We should not do too much, not too too little, and then it is adequate. And then we can understand how everything works together, why our biological propensity for pain explains theater. And our enjoyment that we can get from theater can be explained through, through our, our pain reception under this approach if we assume that everything here is purposively arranged for furthering our vocation. And this is what I want to call theory of integration. And it is not, not developed in full, but I think that the principles and the general method and the formal structure is, is there. And um, I think, that, to be honest, this is not very far off from what modern anthropologists seem to do, as far as I understand that. Um, because anthropology as a science, not philosophical anthropology, but scientific anthropology also tries to be this kind of meta discipline that unites and grounds all the humanities and we have an anthropological understanding of of all kinds of uh, social uh, phenomena under the idea that evolutionary perspectives provide the appropriate um, teleological um, explanations that can be used to explain and make sense of everything that is involved here. And so I understand that I'm already uh, running out of time, but I'm also very close to finishing. Let me get back finally to the um, 
Dobchansky quote that I gave in the beginning. So we, we are making sense of human nature. We are not explaining it for Kant. An explanation is something that is derived from superior principles. That is not, not what is at stake here. I think the appropriate use, uh, uh, notion would be something that he calls an elucidation, eine Erörterung in the critique of judgment. But I think the Dobchansky notion of making sense seems to be a little bit uh, more catchy in this context. We can make sense of human nature by answering why questions in relation to these principles that are sketched above, especially the vocation of humankind, in an adequate and empirical testable way, because anthropology is still an empirical science, and by considering it in an overarching framework of integrative principles. And these integrative principles are, they're relating general human properties and capabilities, not only our biological properties like the propensity to get drunk or to feel pain, but also our, our mental and cognitive uh, capabilities to think and to uh, make judgments in a specific way and to um, have uh, certain kinds of feelings and so on. They are all related to particular, these general human properties are related to particular or understood through particular social situations and that's why they can find different expressions in different cultures and in different times and so on. And in this, we can understand individual motivations and we have an evaluative criterion for interacting with other people. And that's what Kant calls influence or manipulation. Again, as I said, this is not so much about the puppet master pulling strings, but it's about the, the, um, the dinner host who serves an appropriate amount of wine at the appropriate time so that all his participants of the dinner conversation can lift up their spirits and engage in jovial and fun conversation. And it's a manipulation of the theater author who understands that of a feeling of pain follows or needs to follow a feeling of pleasure. And we incorporate that, that natural succession of feelings into his theater place or her theater place and thereby can become a successful theater author. This is the manipulation and influence that Kant is here talking about. And that, of course, only works if we assume an overarching principles of teleological um, judgments that allow us to, to navigate this social context in relation to our given nature, to our embodied nature, and to our nature as it is culturally formed as in my specific cultural upbringing, in my time, and so on that we also need to, to take into uh, consideration. So the diversity of the anthropological material that uh, Schleiermacher has accused Kant of, that it's a mere collection of trivialities, that is not a bug, that's a feature. This is what, what makes all this so attractive because it allows us to, to further our inquiry into human, well, the humanities, the Geisteswissenschaften, the products of the human mind and the human spirit by looking at that through a teleological lens. Nowadays, this teleological framework that Kant has provided is rather unattractive because the idea of a vocation of humankind is not something that many philosophers would look kindly upon. But nowadays, as I said, anthropology uses that in, in the Darwinian framework for the, the idea to, with a different degree of success, to uh, try to unite the humanities and our physiological understanding of our given nature as well. So I think the Kantian anthropological project is rather very, very close to what many, not maybe not all, but many uh, concurrent anthropologists uh, strive to, to work with. And um, it is uh, thus a, a tool that helps us to navigate the conflict between, on the one hand, the general propensities of our, the nature of the human species, 
and the individual motivations that we have and that may stand in a conflict with each other. So while I know what I should do, what is good and uh, bad from an ethical point of view, anthropology helps me to navigate the conflict that certain means can conflict with our propensity because it is not ethics that tells me how much alcohol I'm supposed to drink to have a jovial dinner conversation. Ethics can me at best say that frankness and honesty in dinner conversations would be a virtue, but I need anthropology to find out the adequacy of the instruments that I imply to produce that frankness and honesty in a dinner conversation. So anthropology helps me navigate not only the social world, but also in a broader sense, the, the conflict between our rational duties as rational subjects and our embodied nature of as beings of the human species. And this is why Kant's approach to the human species is so interesting and innovative as uh, looking at it from the vantage point of humanity and not from the vantage point of physiology, nor from the vantage point of rational psychology as in the doctrine of the immortal soul. That's it. Thank you very much for listening. And I hope that was somewhat clear and understandable. I'm looking forward for all kinds of questions and criticism. Please do not hold back on anything. Thanks a lot, uh, Ansgar. So thank you for throwing some fresh light on Kant's anthropology and its function within, uh, well, within the, the total, totality of sciences of the human being. Um, we have now first some uh, comments by Professor Nuria Sanchez Madrid, and after that, um, Ansgar will um, will have the occasion to reply shortly to those comments, and then after that, we will open the discussion for all the participants. So now we go to um, the comments uh, by Nuria Sanchez Madrid. So Nuria had seen the text uh, in advance and has prepared some comments. Nuria Sanchez Madrid is professor of philosophy at the Universidad Complutense in Madrid. She is there the director of the research group Normativity, Emotions, Discourse and Society but she also cooperates as an external member with the philosophy departments of uh, Lisbon and Porto and also with um, the group Ethics and Political Philosophy of the Universidade Federal de Rio Grande do Norte in Natal, Brazil. Nuria Sanchez Madrid is an extremely productive scholar who has published some 70 articles, mostly on Kant's practical and political philosophy and also on his anthropology. That's why we asked her, of course. But she also published on a variety of other authors and subjects, such as Hegel, Hölderlin, Nietzsche, the Italian philosopher Gian Battisto Vico, on Hannah Arendt, on Judith Butler, and on the politics of alt-right. Nuria Sanchez Madrid has edited and co-edited a number of collections, both in Spanish and in English, of which I will only quote those that are most relevant for the topic of today. First of all, she edited a volume entitled Poeticas del Sujeto, Cartografías de lo Humano, which was published in 2018 uh, with the Ediciones Complutense in Madrid. Then she also co-edited a collection with the title Kant's Doctrine of Right in the 21st Century. This was published in the same year, 2018, by the University of Wales Press. She was also one of the editors, together with Andrea Fagion and Alessandro Pizzani, of a volume on Kant and social policies. This was published with Paul Brave Macmillan <coughs> in 2016. And also in 2016, she edited a volume in Portuguese a civilação com destino, Kant e as formas da reflexão. This was published in Florianópolis in 2016. So, Nuria, I'm very pleased that you, um, that you were able to prepare some comments and I'm very curious to hear them. The floor is yours. Thank you, Henny, for this kind introduction. 
Good evening to all. I very much appreciate this kind invitation for taking part in Leuven seminar in classical German philosophy. I'm also very glad to present a response to Ansgar Lissi's paper focusing on Kant's anthropology as a theory of integration. To begin with, I'd like to highlight that Lissi displays in this paper a groundbreaking account of Kant's approach to anthropology. Lissi's paper not only provides a large overview of the accounts that contemporary Kantian scholarship delivered in last decades of this region of Kant's map of sciences, but it rather aims to go forward the opposite values that interpreters as Reinhard Brandt and Robert Loudon granted to this part of Kant's work. Moreover, Lisi emphasizes the purposive features of pragmatic knowledge in Kant's view. That is to say, of the kind of knowledge prudence is. And thus he urges to disentangle its consequences for Kant's account of the human mind and human nature, unfolding a quite stimulating analogy with Darwin's theory of evolution, following the sketch delivered by the genetist Theodosius Dovchansky. I suggest in this point to intertwine this analogy with, an with another targeting on Freudian metapsychology, which could be the issue of another different paper. In my view, the strongest point of the text lays in the purpose to turn the issues usually criticized in the reception of Kant's anthropology, since Schleiermacher's critical review, into opportunities to emphasize its actuality. Put differently, the chosen guideline is to turn the alleged flaws of Kant's anthropology into strengths for fostering the war embodiment of morality in a large sense. In this vein, Lisi praises the metaperspectivism folded in Kant's account of prudence insofar as this knowledge contains an unbounded realm of rules aiming to translate the moral goals of the homo noumenon into the social bounds which frame the homo phenomenon. Furthermore, Lisi argues in a very challenging way that the prudential structures Kant dissects in his anthropology writings in the 1798 book and in his lectures, structures as the vocation of humankind, human purposive germs and predispositions on the task of building up a character, success in making sense, as he highlighted before, of biological and psychological features of human being and his social habits. For example, these structures explain the function that pain has in the human mind on the sense of drunkenness or the, or, or the function of drunkenness as an extended social amusement. As the author himself states in page 15 of the paper, I quote, only within the framework of prudential understanding, physiology can make sense. Thus, the fuzzy field that the empirical account of human mind deploys gains a synoptic aspect when the subject adopts a prudential point of view about the applicability of her actions and the sense of her feelings and emotions. The synoptic view of the war that prudence brings about shows a teleological guideline that naturally shatters with Darwin's biology. But it's undeniable 
that prudence transforms human self-perception in Kant's account and transforms this self-perception in a radical way. After drafting this brief account of the outcomes that Lise's text furnishes, I'd like to claim first that his account substantially differs from those mainly aiming to avow or disavow this work from a philosophical standpoint. Insofar as it addresses, in the wake of Alex Cohen, for example, the impact that prudential rules have on Kant's exploration of human agency and on the commitment of, of Kant's philosophy with human striving for moral improvement. In my view, this proposal dialogues with and also goes further Foucault appraisals appraisal of a spiel, I'm thinking in the play of imagination in the individual subject, but also in the manifold plays that society generates. As an order of discourse, complementing the order of temporal synthesis in Kant's systematic outline of philosophy as a whole. As Foucault, Lisi retrieves from the field of medical humanities, included a contemporary anthropology highlighted in uh, his speech, key tools for analyzing Kant's will to order the chaotic field of prudential norms and values, thus turning them into a helpful assistance for the moral development of human beings. In this context, Kant's postulation of a general purposiveness in the war entities could also be labeled as a prudential norm of judgment, which boosts human epistemic progress through the history of science. Secondly, I like to emphasize that Kant's account of prudence sounds much likely to contemporary ears than Kant's moral theory and his request to abide by the categorical imperative. Lise's paper made me reflect about the scope that Kant's prudence may entail in our current times. In fact, if this knowledge makes the subject conscious of social rules and simultaneously unfolds the anthropological meaning of human common beliefs and feelings, it could be also prudential uh, that the human agent gets acquainted enough with the kind of boundary that the earth as common possession of all humans means for any practical horizon, for building, uh, for opening any practical horizon. It will be also part of a prudent pedagogy to realize the radical interdependence that reciprocally ties all humans. In short, prudence not only instructs the agent to act and behave in the social framework for her own sake, naturally without forgetting her moral goals, as its twin matter, as its twin discipline, physical geography, anthropology also familiarizes the subject with the cosmopolitan vocation of humankind, a task that also helps to better comprehend the dyadic structure, didactic and characteristic of Kant's anthropology book and lectures. In my view, the cosmopolitan pedagogy that prudence entails for Kant especially concerns the contemporary reader. Thank you for your attention and for the opportunity to briefly discuss this very much stimulating paper. Thank you, Nuria. So, um, Ansgar, uh, if you want, you, you can reply to the comments um, 
very favorable comments by Nuria. Uh, I don't really have much to say to this. Thank you very much for these very nice and generous and uh, uh, confirmative uh, words. Um, I may have missed a little bit from the middle of what you said because apparently the internet connection was bad here again. Um, so what what you made me think of in this point, what I found very stimulating was that you were hinting at a prudential and cosmopolitan pedagogy. So this this might allow us to to um, connect this anthropology again to uh, the broader project of the enlightenment which for reasons which i probably do not have to explain uh, to anyone here is more urgent and more uh, of contemporary relevance than um, most people outside of philosophy would uh, assume maybe the what what Kant's anthropology could provide us is not principles. Yeah, the, the principles of our knowing and willing and judging are provided by the by the critiques as some kind of meta theories of different types of knowledge. But what anthropology can do is help us make an appropriate judgment and in a judgment that is grounded in reality of how humans act and live and think but still aimed at what is beneficial and ethical at the same time and i think this capability to make judgments like political judgments of what is realistic in uh, in realistically happening is something importance when it comes to for example conspiracy theories because the the uh, conspiracy theories may not be irrational per se i think they're bad judgments about how things work it's not impossible that things might work this way yeah there are conspiracies but many conspiracy theories suffer from the problem of just bad judgment they are they misunderstand how human beings work in a certain environment like how failure of organization is attributed to evil intentions instead just at bad organization and stupidity and the bad flow of information between otherwise rational actors this is not an irrational sentiment per se but it's a, a bad judgment and um, if we can get an anthropology that helps an, an anthropology that helps us make prudential judgments maybe this can go hand in hand with the project of the enlightenment in a very broader sense that is not furthering knowledge of certain principles and subjecting ourselves rigidly under the principles but about having a realistic understanding of what human beings are up to in their very specific context, even if I am not involved in this context. So I'm not a politician, so I need to learn how politicians work and politics works. So this would be one task for anthropological um, inquiries, maybe to help us get better judgment. And that would be where pedagogy could um, could attach itself to. But the, now I'm, I'm getting far off the original context and uh, but that was something that you made me think of while you were talking about. So thanks very much because the being stimulated is, uh, is uh, needless to say a great thing. Thanks. Thank you Ansgar and thanks again also Nuria. Um, well, now we will start a discussion with all the participants. So those who have questions, please use the function in Zoom to raise the blue hand. And then I will have a look at my screen and um, so I'll try to um, 
give you the floor in the order in which I see the blue hands raising. Can you remind us how to find the blue hand? I always forget. Um, so if I'm, I think you have to go to um, the participants, is that right? Yes, go to participants and then uh, below on the left, you have a raise hand. So I, I see, um, actually now four uh, people who have raised their hands um, and perhaps I give the floor to the first one in my list which is uh, Thomas Sturm mm -hmm. uh, under Kantian Rationality Lab. This is promising. Sorry, I couldn't change the name of, uh, uh, of my, my Zoom for some reason, I don't know why. Um, thank you for the talk and the commentaries. Um, I was wondering, so the, the problem that you're trying to solve is the objection raised by Schleiermacher and by others. And you see, for instance, someone like Brandt in the tradition of Schleiermacher of accusing Kant of, of an unsystematic approach, if not a collection of trivialities. And then if I understand you correctly, your argument is that one ought to seek underlying frameworks, principles, and so on and so forth. And then you make this, detour, which I did not understand why you need to make it into evolutionary biology. And then you finally list those unifying principles that you see in Kant's anthropology. So that seems to be your approach. Um, I think I have three related points. The first one is, um, I would like to know more why you think uh, your approach is original, because the importance of teleology in Kant's anthropology has been emphasized for instance, not only by, by Alex, um, but also by, by Reinhard Brandt, yeah? Um, and how you, if, if you are right, then the appeal to teleology helps to understand why Kant's anthropology is systematic. But that was a point that Brandt himself, the, the importance of, of teleology in, in, in Kant's anthropology was a point that Brandt emphasized, but he denied that it is a, systematic discipline or systematic even science. So you have a problem there in an interpretive or in, in, your, in your struggle with other interpretations, I would rather say. Um, the second thing that I didn't understand is why you make the detour into uh, evolutionary psychology, uh, biology, sorry, at all. Because if one wants to understand how to properly answer the, the problem of that the anthropology looks like a collection of trivialities. Then one must also first notice that Kant himself emphasizes, that's already in the preface of the, of the book uh, of 1789, but it's also in the lectures that you cited time and again, that it's a systematic discipline. Now he does not tell explicitly what makes that discipline systematic, but you could get a cue from other texts in Kant's own corpus. And that's why it's puzzling to me why you go into, um, into evolutionary biology to explain that kind of stuff. Why not start from Kant's own understanding of, um, if you want to have a certain unified discipline, the first thing that you need to have is, he says, is an idea that gives that discipline a coherent structure, an idea and an accompanying scheme. And the question then would be, what is that in Kant's, in Kant's anthropology? Yeah. Um, so that's my methodological question. I leave it at that. I mean, I have many other questions, but um, I'm, I'm curious what you say about these points. Yes, uh, thank you very much. This is very stimulating. I think both questions are related to each other. Um, so what do we do when we give a, a theory and this kind of name or when we subsume it under some kind of concept, we open up a distinct perspective on it. And I think that this perspective of calling it a theory of integration is very different than from calling it a dis systematic science. First off, I think what Kant wants to do as a systematic science 
does not match very well what actually does in the anthropology. Because his uh, approach to systems is much is structured and developed. So I think his uh, critics have actually. Can you still hear me? Yes, I hear you well. Can you hear me? I'm getting a message that my internet connection. Okay, I'm getting the message that my internet connection is unstable. So if I'm starting to fade out again, please forgive me. And uh, so. <clears throat> <clears throat> but uh, I also think that systems can come in uh, more broader, is a broader concept and comes in different uh, shapes mm -hmm. than just the theory of integration. And the theory of integration, maybe you could call it a specific type of system. Okay, I, we can discuss that. Uh, but it's not, for example, the same type of system as Kant outlines it in the metaphysical foundations of uh, the principles of natural science, for example. Of course not. And um, thus, I think Reinhard Brandt is uh, correct when he says uh, that uh, anthropology falls short of being this kind of system because he uses a uh, notion of a system that Kant applies to and develops in the natural foundations, for example. And this is very different from what um, Kant actually does in the anthropology. So my excursus in uh, Darwinian uh, theory of evolution is only used to elucidate and illustrate the notion of what a theory of integration is, because this is what a good example of a successful theory of integration. And um, this is where the notion, which is apparently a common notion in philosophy of biology and philosophy of science comes from. Um, so let me illustrate why I think this is relevant. So when you have explanations in physics as a systematic science, you have a heterogeneous, a homogeneous corpus of knowledge, because this is the nature of causal explanations. And a causal, efficient causal explanation, the explanandum and the explanans needs to be of the same type. Yeah, I can say this movement creates a different type of movement, and I can say money does not causally produce happiness because happiness and money are too different. They belong to different spheres of knowledge and they are conceived under different forms of knowledge. But this does not hold for teleological explanations because teleological explanations, especially when it comes to intentional agents, can connect all different types of things. While I can say truthfully, money does not produce happiness or does not cause happiness, I can still say something like, I'm striving for money because I want to be happy. Yeah? In my intentional actions, these two heterogeneous things can come together. And so I have a framework of explaining things that is absent in physics, especially when it comes to uh, intentional agents. <clears throat> and I think this is a very uh, rather unique form of uh, systematic structures. I'm not so sure if it really holds up to the narrow notion of system that Kant develops. It's rather a broad notion of system. Maybe we should we can distinguish here between a weak and a strong sense of system, but. Uh, I think we, we can use this, for example, to say why anthropology is a science, but it is not a science like physics. And this is a point that Kant often makes. It's, this is not very original, but it's true. But I think the perspective that I open onto it allows us to connect uh, anthropology better to philosophy, because now we can say it is not only one body of knowledge amongst other bodies of knowledge, what I've been calling subdisciplines, like physiology, it is a body of knowledge, but it is also providing a meta framework of principles. That is something that physics, for example, does not do. Physics is one body of knowledge, a subdiscipline like chemistry, but physics does not provide integrative principles. It does not provide the principles under which it is united into a system. 
So uh, I think this uh, this approach allows us to highlight um, uh, the unique function and role that anthropology has. Even today's anthropology can be conceived in very, very similar notions, I think, but this is a different topic. And you're correct that many uh, philosophers have uh, emphasized the importance of teleological judgments. You have mentioned Cohen and Brandt. Holly Wilson is also someone who has written a lot about this and Robert Howden. So I've been, I've been learning a lot from this, but I, I am not so sure whether their position is identical with mine. So okay. is it original? I hope it is. It's, uh, well, we, we did will that talk. answer your question a little bit, your questions? Mm -hmm. Sorry? Mm -hmm. But we can talk another time. <laughs> yeah, I, I would ask you to um, both those who ask questions and perhaps also Ansgar, if you can, uh, to, to be a bit concise. So I have um, okay. uh, five more persons on the list. We can go a bit over time, but not too long because uh, people have other things to do, have schedules and yeah. so on. Um, so the next question uh, is uh, by Eva Vibrevska Dermanovic. Uh, thank you, Anska. Good to see you. Thank you, Anna. Um, I, just w I just have one question. Um, it's not, um, I don't want to criticize your approach because um, I really liked uh, this way of seeing things, but uh, because this is just a very short lecture, what do you what do you make out of Kant's um, parts of his anthropology that we would maybe call bad judgment? You know, in this framework, like like what he writes on races or women or nationalities, like where do you put it? Like you know, Kant is the great philosopher with such bad judgment on something we can of course say oh but these were the times this and what do you do yes uh, that's a good question um i'm not justifying anything Kant says. first of all i think his anthropology is still plagued by a lot of problems especially that notion of a vocation of humankind you need to be you need to have a strong notion of creation, creation by an intentional agent to hold up, hold this position up today. And I think paradoxically, this nation of purposive creation conflicts with large other parts of Kant's philosophy because it personifies God and thinks of God as an agent and so on. So Kant gives us the resources to make this account of vocation very problematic. So I'm approaching this text from a largely historical perspective. And uh, Kant definitely has problematic ideas about race and sex. And he's also an anti-Semite. Yeah, while we're talking about racism, I think the anti-Semitic ideas of Kant are often overlooked and also bad. <laughs> um, <clears throat> But to look at this from another angle, Kant upholds the idea of a unity of humankind as a species. And the diversity of human, the different shapes and forms that humans come from has, under his perspective of a vocation, has a purpose. So even if there are races, genders, religious beliefs that are dysfunctional and uh, less worth, as Kant would put it, unfortunately, uh, they are still part of the overall plan and still part of the human species and their, their, their differentiation is purposive. So it, it has a function and um, so I, I often like to think that Kant as a metaphysician likes to think of variety and unity as complementary concepts. You cannot think of a unity of the human species without a variety, and you cannot think of a variety of, without thinking unity. <clears throat> I, I, I gave a talk in Oslo at the Kant conference on this, this argument. Um, 
but as I said, this does not excuse anything. This maybe contextualizes it a bit, but uh, Kant, Kant makes a lot of bad judgment. He could have known better. He had anti-racist alternatives available like Diderot and Forster, and he did not go down that path. There's nothing to excuse here. So not much, I have to say. <laughs> There's another question by uh, Megant. I, I do not know your full name, sorry. Yeah, Megant Susan. Thanks for your talk, Ansgar. Uh, my question is actually, uh, I think Thomas uh, Sturm already asked, I'm, I'm really asking about the, the scientific status of uh, anthropology. Because it seems at one level um, that it's, it's really taking from let's say Kant tried to quickly cobble together a pragmatic anthropology as the scientific form of the uh, collection of trivialities, according to Schleiermacher. And it feels that you are taking that same idea further. And I was trying to, just like Thomas was asking, what's the, within Kant's system, what would be the motivating principles for such a science? And they seem to me, and that's what you close with, you close with saying it's not psychology, and even uh, Professor Madrid was seeing it in terms of possibly being added to psychology or additions from psychology. So I'm thinking more in that direction. I'm remembering also uh, Mikhail Wolf talking about uh, anthropology in Hegel and how it is coupled with uh, the theory of the Zähle uh, in the third part of the encyclopedia as of that it's still in transition and that's why Hegel's sort of putting things together like that. So I'm feeling there are so many grounds for thinking of whatever Kant's doing as anthropology as under psychology, um, as a reform in uh, Professor de Bau and Boyer's uh, way of uh, rational physiology or physiology as such uh, in the traditional schemes. So why not psychology? You know, why, why something else? Sure, but why not psychology? Well, for Kant, psychology would be either the observation of agency uh, or the doctrine of the soul as empirical and rational psychology. But um, not everything that he is interested in is about uh, only psychology. As I said, there are bodily thoughts about the nature of physiology and the relevance of physiology and also the the um, other parts of the humanities. I mean, uh, I think it depends a lot about how far or how narrow you conceive of psychology. If psychology is everything that pertains to the actions of uh, rational or of, of human agents, then yes, the rational psychology plays a, a major role here, obviously. But um, as soon as we derive uh, the object of our observations, not from actual human beings that we observe in the free, but for example, through literary texts or through uh, religious texts, then we would nowadays call this literary studies or religious studies, because that's what we derive the, the knowledge of these agents from. So if a, Kant discusses, as I, or not discusses, he just hints at the possibility of understanding the theater <clears throat> as uh, following some embedded, embodied Russian physiological principles of following, uh, of pain, for, uh, pleasure following pain, which can be used for motivational purposes, psychology, plays a part in it when it comes to, to uh, the motivational structure, but it is connected still to the physiological understanding of uh, the pain and pleasure structures, and it is connected to the study of the theater, because that's what we're talking in this case here. This is not a study of human agency, but it is why theater works for us. So if you want to call this uh, as a part of psychology, I'm not against it, but usually it would be part of one of the other humanities probably. Did that explain a little bit your question? So I have a very vague answer because it depends on how you draw the boundaries and I don't know how 
far we want to go into this. Okay, then there's a question uh, by George Huxford. You probably need to unmute yourself. Yes, I've, got, I've got it. I hope. Um, yeah, th thanks for your presentation. Um, the um, I have a comment rather than a, um, a a question. Can you speak up a little bit, please? Uh, yeah. Can, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Right. I shall. Uh, I shall shout. <laughs> um, the uh, yeah, I have a comment rather than a question. Um, I'm taking as the kernel of your thesis. Um, the um, anthropology is an integrative function and um, I, I'd like to draw attention to two of the examples that you use um, uh, pain and alcohol um, pain um, I, I believe strengthens your case because what you're what we are talking about in, in terms of integrative function are the um, the uh, physiology of the capability of pain um, with the psychology of our reaction to it. So I think that's, that, um, that serves you well. On the other hand, um, alcohol, I, I think you run the risk of a, um, Kant's view on that uh, becoming an object of humor or even ridicule um, because it it reminds me of Voltaire and, and why we have noses, because to put our uh, otherwise we wouldn't have anywhere to put our glasses. So the idea that um, that um, yeah, with alcohol, um, we obviously have the um, physiological uh, um, sensitivity um, to ethyl alcohol, um, uh, but it the alcohol itself is, a, is just a contingent discovery of, of, of it's got nothing to do with humans or human um, capabilities it's, it's just the contingent um, discovery of, of the action of yeast on sugar um, so I, I yeah I, I worry that the, the the good parts of your thesis and, and presentation um, would, would um, this acts the alcohol acts to detract from them uh, well, yes, thank you for your for your worries. You're right, Kant is a little bit ridiculous here in this point. He loves the topic of drunken dinner parties and he goes on and on about it. It's, it's an interesting topic of ethical relevance because here something comes to the fore when we look at the, the way he discusses it in the groundworks and uh, he discusses drunkenness and the groundworks and then the metaphysics of in the, in the critic of practical reason. I think there's a passage on this too because Kant's ethics comes in rigid principles and you either are allowed to do something or you're not allowed to do something. But the question of drunkenness is a question of degrees and you can see that can somehow a little bit struggles with that he says yeah on the one hand it's good if you do it in moderation but if you if you exaggerate it and you lose your senses and your self-control you get to be treated like an animal this is literally what he says you lose your human rights and at least as i understand them for the time that you're drunk people can treat you like an animal because you've lost your humanity to alcohol, excessive alcohol consumption. So this is, I think this, there's a lot of interesting topics to it and Kant struggles to deal with it. You're right that, that uh, alcohol is a contingent byproduct or drunkenness or capability to get drunk is a contingent byproduct of evolution probably. But for Kant, as uh, you know from the critique of judgment, you have a system of ends. And in this system of ends, you can at least approach every part of nature as if it had an end. And it, uh, it allows you to at least inquire into things under the guise of looking for purposes. And uh, if you apply this to the anthropology, then this is what Kant is doing here. He looks at the, or 
propensity to be drunk and says, yeah, that makes sense because it allows us to be, overcome obstacles in life. So his, his uh, observational stance under the uh, guiding idea of universal teleology that he has justified in the critique of judgment comes to a fruition here. Maybe he overdoes it, that's true. Um, but uh, I think the, the, the discussion of drunkenness is actually can be used to showcase a lot of interesting connections in Kant's ethics and in Kant's anthropology as well. And maybe that's why he says that uh, drunkenness needs to be discussed specifically in the pragmatic anthropology. So apparently it was of great importance to Kant. But yeah, thanks for your worry. I will, I will consider if I can maybe find a better example. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Ansgar. Uh, we have in fact three more questions. We can't um, allow them all within the space of the official length, so to say, of this seminar. I propose that I give the floor to Alex Cohen, who is another expert on the anthropology. Sure. And then we have Abraham Anderson and Wailam Fu, um, they can stay with us after the official ending and still will have the availability to ask their questions. So, uh, Alice, please, uh, your question. Yes, hi. Uh, sorry, there's someone cooking in the background, so maybe a bit noisy, but I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm sorry to be jumping the queue. I didn't mean to do that. I, and in fact, I don't really have a question, but I just wanted to say that I really enjoyed the paper. And I think that this idea of integration i mean thinking of anthropology as an in integrative um as having an integrative function is is um very novel and very exciting at least for me as as you mentioned i've, I've worked on the anthropology for a while um and connecting it to you know these kind of contemporary debates in philosophy of science and thinking about it in terms of bringing together all these different um types of kind of epistemic formats and epistemic tools uh, that were available um, at the time to Kant uh, is, I think, exactly what he was trying to do. So I think you're capturing something fundamental about, uh, about the, the Kantian um, conception of anthropology. Um, a lot of us have struggled um, with trying to label it, you know, is it psychology, is it, you know, sociology, is it what we now call anthropology? Uh, Zamito has tried to, you know, put in a kind of historical uh, development of anthropology as a science, but, you know, of course, it, it, it's kind of hard to, to pinpoint exactly what it's doing. And I think thinking about it in terms of integrating all these different models and, and all these different kind of areas of knowledge is, is, is in a way exactly what what it was so yeah so i just wanted to say this this is this is great and sounds very promising uh and on a kind of side note um rebounding on the discussion the questions that just happened um i also agree with you that um things like i mean not just because I was, i've been drinking my beer but also because uh, i think there is something interesting uh to say about consumption of alcohol and dinner parties and so on uh, and i think that um it's i can see that you know Seen from afar, it, it may seem like trivial, trivial points, but actually, um, I don't think it is. And I think you can make something quite interesting and important and relevant to, you know, people's lives and the way people think about um, their their agency and you know the way they interact with other people and with the world. And I think that's what Kant was trying to uh, get to in his anthropology. So yeah, so I, I guess I was just trying to send you some supportive vibes and thinking that you know i, I enjoyed it very much so thank you yeah. thank you very much that means a lot to me this is great feedback and i i'm really really feeling much better now <laughs> thank you this is very helpful Good. so I, I agree this is a great note to end the official meeting um, so as usual, we will leave open the Zoom meeting um, for some more informal uh, meeting, uh, some more informal talk. And uh, as I said, um, the others who have questions can stay on. I hope that Ansgar has some time to stay with us. Um, let me sure. uh, inform you of the next session of the Lutheran seminar, 
uh, this will be in two weeks, so on February the 11th, um, we will have a talk by Stefan Bert Pollen, uh, he with the title "Making Space for the Unconscious: Kant, Schopenhauer, and Freud," and we will have as a respondent uh, Alistair Weltman. So um, now I have the uh, the task to thank uh, Ansgar Lissi, Nuria Sanchez, and all the participants for the feedback and the questions. And I hope to see you back um, on another session. Bye. Thank you all for listening and having me. Thanks. Thank you.